Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for your patience. This is the 10th and final event of the virtual symposium Recursive Colonialism, Artificial Intelligence and Speculative Computation. We are the Critical Computation Bureau, a collective of researchers, artists and writers working at the intersection of technology and culture, computer science and information theory, aesthetics and politics. Recursive Colonialism, Artificial Intelligence and Speculative Computation 2020 aims to provide interventions in the technopolitics of racial capitalism and its recursive regeneration, mixing together critical and creative practices and borrowing models and methods from the philosophy of technology, black studies, political theory, computer science and information theory, media aesthetics, cultural and digital media theories. Please check our manifesto on the website and the online special issue Control Society at 30, published in the Periscope of Social Text online. We also thank Duke University, which has sponsored this symposium, together with the University of Pennsylvania and L'Università di Napoli L'Orientale. For more information on this project or to contact us, feel free to check out our website, www.recursivecolonialism.com, and to follow our socials. My name is Tiziana Terranova. My co-facilitator is Oana Parvan. We call this day of the symposium episode 10 plus 11, Mass Debilitation and Algorithmic Governance. And we've accompanied today's dialogue with an exclusive music set by Shannon SP. The set will premiere on YouTube in two hours and will remain archived on our YouTube channel. The format of this session will be the following. Our guests will both talk for 20 minutes each, then 10 minutes each. After that, or in this case, I think uh, a bit longer, some of the, uh, as uh, Jasper just told us that her answer will be incorporated into the first uh, uh, part of the dialogue as they've already been talking. After that, the speakers will address a few questions that you can type into your Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please remember to state clearly which speaker your question is addressed to. Our co-facilitator will pick up as many questions as possible and the chair will address them to the panelists. I also want to remember all panelists not to check the Q&A box as all questions will be verbally asked by the chair. Please type in your questions in the Q&A box at any time of the session. This session is also streamed live on our YouTube channel. Today, we are extremely proud to host the dialogue between our guest, Jasbir Puar and Ezekiel Dixon Roman. Jasbir Puar is professor and graduate director of women's and gender studies at Rutgers University, where she has been a faculty member since 2000. Her most recent book is The Right to Maim, Debility, Capacity, Disability, uh, 2017, published with Duke University Press in the series Anima, Critical Race Studies Otherwise, that she co-edits with Mel Chen. Poir is the author of award-winning Terrorist Assemblages, Homo Nationalism in Queer Times, from 2007. Ezekiel Dixon Roman is a director of the Master of Science in Social Policy Program, chair of the Data Analytics for Social Policy Certificate of the Master's of Science in Social Policy Program, at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of Inheriting Possibility, Social Reproduction and Quantification in Education, published in 2017 by University of Minnesota Press. He also co-edited Thinking Comprehensively About Education, Spaces of Educative Possibility and Their Implications for Public Policies, uh, published in uh, 2012 by Rutledge, as well as co-guest uh, edited uh, Alternative Ontologies on Number, Rethinking the Co Quantitative in Computational Culture, published in 2016 as Cultural Studies Critical Methodologies. And finally, the Computational Third in Education Research, Critical and Creative Perspective on the Digital Data Deluge, Deluge from 2017 Research in Education. So welcome to you both and over to Jasbir and Etzige. 
Thank you, uh, Tatiana, uh, for this um, uh, really gracious introduction. And uh, thank you to Awana, Brian, and the media team for the absolutely amazing and impressive curating, designing, ushering, and host work of this symposium. I'd also like to extend my appreciation to Jasbir for being in conversation with me today. This is a conversation that has been um, energetically ongoing, I shall, I shall say. I, although it began explicitly back in October when I hosted Jasbir for the Control Society Speaker Series, I co-curate. I have been engaging her work since the publication of Terrorist Assemblages in 2007. Thus, I am really excited to continue this conversation today with Jasbir and under the auspices of recursive colonialism. I'd like to begin my comments today with a quote from Catherine McKittrick's uh, Mathematics Black Life. Open quote, I trust that the unindexed lies of our world and the evidence of what transpired are not blueprints for emancipation or maps to our future, but instead are indicators of the ways in which the brutalities of racial encounter demand a form of human being and being human that newly iterates blackness as uncomfortably enumerating the unanticipated contours of black life. McKittrick's thinking, uh, and I should say close quote, sorry, McKittrick's thinking and interpreting differently the indexes of colonial and anti-black violence as open quote, uncomfortably enumerating the unanticipated contours of black life, close quote, is not simply an alternative reading but in fact, a line of flight from the damned and pejorative narratives of Black life. In my 2016 article, Algoritmo, I hyphenated the Spanish word for algorithm so as to delineate the word conjunction of, al of algorithm in the Spanish, translated as something and rhythm. In particular, I, I played off the word rhythm to speak to what Derrida called, iter called iterability in speech acts. Derrida argued that what made speech acts effective are, the, are their iterability, that is repetition with alterity. For Derrida, it was the alterity that enables conditions of possibility, not, not determination, but rather play. In fact, what McKittrick is calling for with ma Mathematics of Black Life is to engage in an alternative reading of the enumeration of colonial and anti-Black violence that readers and reading otherwise excuse me, that renders a reading otherwise, that points toward those that survived or lived the, the, uh, the legacies of, of anti-Black violence and colonial violence. Implied in McKittrick's focus on the contours of Black life, as well as in the ritmo of algor algoritmo, are patterns or rhythms that I would like to focus on today. As it's these patterns or rhythms where I will argue lie the art or poetics of quantification. This is particularly important given that I will argue that algorithmic governance is a process of recursive rhythms and patterns. It is these patterns and rhythms that preemptively shape a racializing affect in what Jasbir calls slow life and debility. It is through these patterns and rhythms that I argue that algorithmic governance is made up of a system of modulating diffractive mechanisms or diffractive modulators that seek to compress the information patterns and rhythms of the world. It is here where I see the potentiality of a poetics of other hyphen wise diffractive patterns toward rerouting the onto epistemology of the recursive system of algorithmic governance. It is to algorithmic governance where I turn first. Since World War II, Societies that have been shifting from systems of institutional enclosures disciplining the ways of being of citizens to systems of infinite and continuous modulating mechanisms, generatively controlling access and human behavior. Digital technologies and the internet of things have enabled increasingly more distributed logics, rationalities and practices of governance via cybernetic systems of communication and predictive control. While sovereign discipline and control technologies of capture continue to exist in concert, it is increasingly control that becomes the dominant logic of systems of governance. Within this context of cybernetic systems of governance, control has become the guaranteed form of truth. That is, the assured path to truth is to create the present futurity of truth. Thus, rather than try to prevent or deter the empirically verifiable, cybernetic systems of control work on the temporization that manufactures a becoming assemblage such as an event, organization, or body 
as a threat, an anxiety, or desire of, of present futurity. In other words, regardless of whether a becoming assemblage is empirically or, obje objectively or objectively verifiable, a future becoming event is constructed based on an already existing predispositions or beliefs. The operative logic for such an, an environment of manufactured futurity is preemptive action. Its, uh, its modus operandi is, is to generate actions based on already existing predispositions or visceral bodily responses of presenting past. The affect of a threat based on presenting past and present futurity, a quote, quote unquote history of the present, is a form of control that is ontogenetic. This is what Brian Masumi calls ontopower, a power of emergence and a becoming sovereign. Preemption is an operative logic that works on, an, on a temporization which constructs the threat, anxiety or desire as a futurity, one that can never be false. It plays on indeterminacies to both manufacture truth, absent that which is objectively verifiable, and maintain truth claims indefinitely based on the always what would have or could have. The preemptions are not because of an empirically verifiable fact, but rather an affective fact that's generated based on that which would have happened or could have happened if preemptive action did or does not occur. Thus, whether the threat, anxiety, or desire materializes or not, it will always be what it would have or could have been. Once constructed as present futurity, it will always be casted in futurity as an anticipated threat, anxiety, or desire that always could have materialized. The predictive intelligence of algorithmic governance works on the generative operative logics of ontopower. Alg algorithms process data on individual phenomena producing statistical and psychometric classifications of behaviors and profiles without ever asking the individual themselves what or who they are or what or who they could become. As a result, as Antoinette Rovroy and Burns argue in their, in their articulation of algorithmic governmentality, algorithmic governance enables acts that circumvent the reflexive subject and processes of subjectification. Through algorithmic governance, power is less focused on the capacities of understanding, ability, or expression, and more focused on individual phenomena that make up statistical and psychometric present future classifications or profiles to inform preemptive decision making and action. These algorithmically produced present future classifications or profiles from presenting pasts include the coming events such as the risk of committing a violent offense, the potential performance on a state mandated standardized test, or the profit maximization in the supply chain process. Governance here is not about the steering or intervention of government institutions, but rather a techno-political system that seeks to generatively control populations and systems of relation toward the shaping of future scenarios for the regeneration of capital accumulation. Thus, cybernetic systems of algorithmic governance have no limits in their data consumption and production. They are not limited to algorithmic deployments of public policy or military intervention, nor are they limited to the decision-making practices of governance. Rather, algorithmic governance consumes and produces a generalized matrix of individual data in all quotidian processes of social life, making use of whatever will enhance its stated aims of predictive precision that ultimately is about shaping future scenarios of capital accumulation. Algorithmic governance produces a facade of the ultimate objectivity where the former legitimated and authorized authority is displaced into the instrumental reason of technology, leaving nothing or no one to appeal to. Given that the predicted threat or event is in the future, on what evidence, conditions, or rationale can one appeal the predictive statistical or psychometric classifications of algorithmic governance? There are no committed actions or event to defend only the history of individual data re-aggregated with other data. And this data is often riddled with errors. These false notions of objectivity are of particular importance as one of the purported arguments for algorithmic governance is that such cybernetic systems will enable less partiality and greater efficiency in political decision-making, as well as greater democratic possibilities. However, if systems of democratic practice have been built on hierarchizing logics of human difference and variation, then the identity and difference necessitated by algorithms will carry on those logics under the guise of objectivity. In fact, 
Others have argued that the default of techno-social systems are discriminatory in their design. While I'm sympathetic to this argument, my intervention is not based on a critique of exclusion, but rather on an inherited ontoepistemology of the algorithm, an ontological process of becoming and epistemological processing of information. Here, algorithmic governance entails a potentiation of value from and through machines in order to grant a recursive reconfiguration of being. This recursion of reconfigured being is one based on a transparency principle that is the formation of the post-enlightenment subject, which assumes hierarchies of human difference, continues to haunt the machine. Thus, rather than ask the question, who was included in the design of the technology, or how is difference encoded into the machine? I am interested in the techno-social systems ontoepistemology that is shaped by the colonialist reason of the post-enlightenment subject. Through this cybernetic system of governance are patterns and rhythms of information that the system seeks to compress into its existing logics. In algorithmic governance, the existing logics are based on predefined operationalizations of laws and policies. The algorithmic modulators process the information patterns and rhythm, rhythms attempting to enfold, uh, oh, I just lost my face, attempting to enfold the variability of knowing into the political, juridical, transparent, or self-determining subject. The patterns and rhythms of this recursive system includes the regular generation of data through digital interactions and encounters with state institutions the regular training of algorithms and the pattern selective use of training data, the systemic use of algorithms to inform institutional decision-making, the shaping of behaviors and the social due to the violent act of the undecidable, and how the algorith algorithmic prediction becomes already futures past as the shaping of the social becomes a individual data generated for algorithmic compression. What's important to note is that this process of recursion is not a process of reproduction, but rather a spiraling regeneration of Promethean man. These rhythms of algorithmic governance then become a significant part in the shaping of time and space and what Jasper calls slow life. It is through these random patterns, yet calculated rhythms of checkpoint practices in relation to biopol biopolitical technologies and logics of uncertainties that bring into emergence an assemblage of racialized ontologies, one that is based on a recursive modulation of temporality in order to slow down life, even in the face of the speed of modernity. Here, I do think Sylvia Winter's sociogenic principle can be helpful to rethink how algorithmic rhythms and patterns of sociopolitical relations become ontogenic via the flesh slash body shaping the neurobiological structure of the, of the flesh, and as such, what I've called racializing affect. My articulation of racializing affect borrows from Michelle Stevens' skin acts, where she argues that the flesh can be felt and mimetically shared. It is the ontological remainder of the skinned body, that which is the material, material remainder of the symbolic and discursive constitution of the skin. For Misumi, this is the proprioception that enfolds the sensations of the skin into the material memory of the muscular body and autonomic system. It is in this material remainder, Stevens argues, where one finds the racialized body, a black subject before the symbolic race. Racializing affect is inseparable from patterns and rhythms of techno-social systems and the historicity of colonialism, that which reduces and stretches temporality while modulating the speed of life. These modulated patterns and rhythms, what can be exceptionally felt right now in the pandemic, can be understood in terms of diffraction. In my dialogue with Ramon Amaro last week, I mentioned the potentiality of diffraction for computationally identifying, undoing, exercising, or conjuring the bodies of the racial other in their diffractive wake. I'd like to unpack this a bit further as I conclude yet with a focus on the diffractive apparatus of algorithmic governance. In contradistinction from the optics of homology, diffraction is interested in the produced differences that make a difference. Diffraction is an idea of theoretical physics that refers to the bending of wave patterns when they are obstructed by an interfering object. In the two-slit diffractive apparatus example, 
the the way the the bended and produced wave patterns spread and overlap when they encounter an interfering structure with two openings. The classic example Karen Barad gives is when waves from the ocean encounter an obstruction of land with a gap or hole in it. The waves bend and spread as they pass through the gap. The obstruction of land with a gap is a diffraction apparatus and the wave pattern is diffracted. Thus diffraction is not about the reflective search for sameness, but the focus on differences that make a difference. In other words, diffraction focuses on the nature or effect of relational and connected differences, or what De Silva characterizes as difference without separability. I'd like to briefly use the example of the Facebook ad API. Although we are not able to gain direct access to the proprietary ad algorithm of the Facebook ad API, it is possible to back your way into understanding what the algorithm is doing via a series of experiments. In a study conducted by Ali and colleagues, they sought to do just that. Through their study, they learned that while advertisers can specify the parameters of the target populations they would like to reach, Facebook's ad algorithm employs an automated optimization procedure that deploys the ad already beyond what was initiated. In other words, Facebook is running automatic text and image classification on ads in order to calculate a predicted relevance score to users. This alters who sees this ad before it is even interacted with users. By, in addition, th this study found that the amount of money invested in the Facebook ads, the content of the ads, and user interactions with the ad, i.e. generated ad clicks, each shaped who became digitally interpolated by the ad. In fact, in a bodybuilding ad, the study created, they, they found the ad was delivered to over 75% men, uh, to 75% of men on average, while a cosmetics ad they created was delivered to over 90% of women on average. Although we may not know the specific algorithms of the Facebook ad API, we do have a good sense of its diffractive force. This Facebook example is based on, uh, on autopoiesis and a recursive system that seeks to regenerate its logic as exemplified in its diffracted patterns, which are scaled against axioms of a particular archetype of man. The diffracted are patterns, rhythms, intensities, entangled relationalities, material movement, and temporally entangled becoming processes. While the recursive system is finite, the information rhythms and patterns are infinite. Thus, when the recursive system seeks to compress indeterminacies, it produces diffractive patterns and rhythms of discontinuity or disjuncture. In a system of autopoiesis, the algorithm will seek to regenerate the changing same logic of transparency, as in the, F Facebook, ad as in the Facebook ad API. Yet in a system of allopoiesis, a system that is fundamentally open to the potentiation of epistemological transformation, the diffraction of the creative indeterminacies of blackness will open up the system to patterns and rhythms of, of other, to patterns and rhythms otherwise, even toward what Luciana Parisi has called a xenopatterning or alien intelligence. It is, here, I, it is here where I see Denise Ferreira da Silva's articulation of a black feminist poetics important particularly toward the development of the art or poetics of quantification. De Silva seeks to push a thinking and reading without modern categories. As she argues, it is via the formalizations of the law, policy, calculation, measurement, and computation that arrests blackness's creative potential. And I can't help but think uh, Althusser says interpolation here, but in fact, she pushes us to consider how modern categories, especially of time, history, or development, have shaped the text or, e or an event, and as such, to address the colonial and racial subjugation. As she states, for the Black feminist poetics, a moment of radical praxis acknowledges the creative capacity blackness is, the, the creative capacity blackness indexes, reclaims expropriated total value, and demands for nothing less than decolonization. That is a reconstruction of the, of the world with the return of the total value without which capital would not have thrived and, and off which it still lives. As I stated last week, and I should say, sorry, that was a quote from De Silva directly. 
As I stated last week, this is a practice of thinking and reading that forces one to locate or identify the haunting logics of what happened that's imminent in the what happens, how the what happens anticipates the what is yet to happen, and how the what happened is already imminent in the what is yet to happen. Yet, I also want to argue that what De Silva pushes us to consider is a radical recursive praxis, one that is allopoetic, works without modern categories, and is open to the creative potential of Blackness. Such a system, what might be characterized as a poetics of quantification, would enable the transformative potential of diffractive patterns and rhythms of onto epistemologies otherwise, while also enabling the potentiality of alternative futures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tzikiel. I will now leave the floor to Jasper Poir for a part of the, of the dialogue. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thank you to uh, Tiziana and also to um, Ezekiel for uh, inviting me to this conversation. I'm thrilled to be here um, and also just thrilled to be part of this remarkable programming that's been ongoing for this past 12 days. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a kind of smattering of thoughts. It's not really an argument about anything. Um, and there are a lot of digressions here um, that I'll try to uh, make sense of and, and links to. Um, I've also enfolded my comments to my initial comments to Ezekiel's paper um, into, into the following. Um, and as already stated by Ezekiel, this is a conversation that's been going on um, in response, started, started um, uh, deliberately started um, a few months ago in response to a paper I delivered on slow life. Um, this paper had particular reference to Palestine, but it was also thinking through a relationship between disaster capitalism and carceral capitalism and the production of a splintering occupation through the modulation of registers of time. So historical and civilizational time, the stealing of time through the expansion of labor time, the refusal or withholding of temporal simultaneity that is so coveted in our connective technologies and that signal modernity. But most significantly, the cordoning off and thus the creation of space through time. This cordoning off requires both the physical architectural structures that are understood as obstacles to free flowing speed, rhythm and pace. So checkpoints, so, uh, uh, highways, uh, divided highways, settlement locations, the partitioning of land and populations into areas A, B and C. Nothing ever happens on time. As Rima Hamami and other scholars on Palestine have pointed out, the stretching of time, so the West Bank is both smaller because movement is short circuited and also larger because it takes longer to move from one place to another. This stretching of time is not a byproduct of surveillance. It is the point of this surveillance. Uncertainty becomes a primary affective orientation, a folded into the flesh condition of possibility and ontology of sorts. As Ezekiel comments, quote, uncertainty is this um, stochiastic or indeterminate part of statistical modeling end quote. So the indeterminate is thus an ontological recoding of uncertainty that escapes the algorithmic governance of the bio-necropolitical state. The moment when preemptive power that is meant to shape outcomes is exceeded by the emergent potentialities of those outcomes. The desire of preemptive power to control uncertainty in this case is further complicated when uncertainty is in, in fact the desired outcome to control not order and to create certainty, but rather to create uncertainty, indeed the certainty of uncertainty. So slow life um, is a reckoning with this kind of capitalist capture of uncertainty. Um, and I was struck by Ezekiel's phrase, um, the compressing of indeterminacies. Mm -hmm. Slow life also refers to following Jackie Wang's conceptualization of carceral capitalism how carceral administrative structures, for example, the permit regime, ground people in space and alter the capacities of capitalist metrics of time, both of the quotidian and of the lifetime. 
uh, Nefertiti Tadier's work on lifetimes is especially pertinent here. Time and space are not, as the accelerationists might posit, exponentially compressed, endlessly linked, nor more rapidly interfacing, but rather are a series of discontinuous refractions that are recursive, part of the structure and event linkages of settler colonialism, a colonialism that violently partitions indigenous bodies from native land. And I later posit that maiming is another form of rupture between bodies and land. I have called this kind of relation between time and space, time itself. Time itself, I argued, was not the same as the time lost to the continual expansion of labor time and reproduction of the laborer and its ability, his, her, they, abil their ability to get to and undertake labor. Time itself does not have um, the modern categories of time, history, and development that De Silva problematizes, um, does not have the past, the present, nor the future as primary reference points. As a stratum of matter, time itself as an affective modality is not of the laboring body, but of the para and sub-individual capacities of bodies. Unlike affective labor, Time itself refers to the laboring of affect, a laboring that contributes to the capitalist profitability and expansion that is the deepening entrenchment of technologies of containment, globally speaking, of the occupation. It is less a stripping away of individual properties, rather an endless interfacing of individual data and metrics um, to reference, again, Ezekiel's presentation from last week. Time itself is not extracted from individual bodies, rather produced through the endless circuitry of individual material. Time itself is individual time. Um, and there's, a, I think, a conversation here around um, racializing affect that I, that I wanted to uh, flag insofar as this kind of commonly accepted definition of affect is the capacity to affect and be affected. Um, that the, the work of racializing affect happens through the um, rupture of that reciprocity, or uh, it is the work of the rupturing of that uh, fantasized reciprocity. What is the corporeal in these individual processes? I'm interested in how individualization is both digital and of the flesh, involving series of recursive relationality, as well as a way of unseeing not necessarily literal seeing, though sometimes it is literal seeing, and re-seeing corporeality. Um, following Catherine McKittrick, Ezekiel had asked after the mathematics of Palestinian lives, and I believe that this math is an interfacing of computational sovereignty and a more banal and mundane sovereign right to maim. What Ezekiel calls the art of quantification refers to the art performance piece, for example, of Palestinian Khaled Jarrar's um, work in front of Wall Street, where he sells a 10 millimeter vial of his own blood at the price of global arms industry companies. Think Wesson and Smith, for example, or the now infamous Safari Land, a disgraced former board member of the Whitney Museum, Warren Kanders owns. The art of quantification can also refer to the act of tallying the number of knees successfully shot by the IDF during a day of sniper targeting of the Great March of Return protesters in Gaza. Or we can look at the epidemic of blindness in Kashmir, the result of targeting of hundreds of eyes with pellet bullets meant to be non-lethal since 2010, or even more recently, the blinding of hundreds of protesters in the uprisings in Chile during this past year alone. This art exceeds the process of tabulation as it involves a scrambling of fleshly registers. There is often a recourse to the presumed relay, relay of Sylvia Winter's humanism here. The protesters need to be dehumanized or have never been humanized in order to be shot. De Silva notes the limits of this form of ideological unveiling while Jaina Brown points out in her wonderful just about to be published book on black utopias that Winter's uh, concept of the man as human has curiously been a reinstatement of the primacy of human forms, a speciesism riding on human exceptionalism. Um, and this is something else I wanted to ask Ezekiel about, um, about how individual economies deprioritize human forms in his understanding of algorithmic governance. And I mean that 
not just in terms of breaking down human forms into um, data, uh, series of datas, um, but also in terms of a kind of um, interspecial economy. If we are to understand something, anything about what Joseph Puglisi calls a more than human biopolitics, it is that the individual and not the individual, it, it is the inhuman and not the human that is the instrumentalized unit of such a biopolitics. It is a biopolitics condition, not through humanity, nor even an interspecies spectrum, but through pure capacitation and its metrics. It is also important to note that the art of quantification and forming individual economies does not demote the individual to a stripped down individual. In other words, the individual individual relation is not a correlate to the human and dehuman one. As Ezekiel notes in his theorization of the haunting as recursive embedded in the recent New York Times piece on fake faces, individual data does not so much strip the individual to a individual data set, rather um, integrates these data sets into serial relationalities that inaugurate a new face that never was and is yet to be. Individual data thus productively induces forms of relationality that do not so much erase the individual nor even redistribute it, rather de-exceptionalizes the individual through the potentiation of as yet to be known relationalities that are imminent in the present renderings of past data. The blockade of Gaza is algorithmic governance enacted through logistics, infrastructures of electricity, water, medical facilities, border crossings, cement and other rebuilding materials, fertilizer, human aid, uh, humanitarian aid visas, medical travel permits, all of these and more are modulated to create an elastic, breathing, expandable, and contractible scene of movement. While COVID has raised pertinent, uh, persistent questioning about what it means to social distance and to quarantine and shelter in place in a place like Gaza, the West Bank, or Kashmir, places already considered to be contained and in some sense cut off, especially in regards to the internet shutdown in Kashmir, Part of the power of logistical governance is not only to produce experiences of containment while actually tarrying in endless porosity, but also to sustain the myth of containment. That is not to minimize the obstacles to mobility that inform the blockade or any blockade, but to point out that the production of containment relies on a projection of fantasized freedom elsewhere and here. Um, so on what parameters do we presume we are or are not contained? How is containment a precondition for certain capacitations and productivities? Um, and in, an, in another piece, I talk a bit more about how movement and mobility are redefined and remade and relived otherwise um, outside of these terms. And here I want to turn a little to um, the question of the prehensive. What, what uh, Ghassan Abu Sitta calls the titration of life entails individual data, normative metrics of health, fertility, thriving, stunting, birth rates, longevity, productivity, drive this me mechanism of modulation, contraction, and expansion. If on one hand, Gaza was determined by the United Nations in 2014 to be unlivable by the year 2020, on the other hand, 1.8 million people continue to live in conditions with only 85% drinkable water, food and medical supply shortages, and generational mass debilitation. The notion of livability here is less a humanistic measure and more a pronouncement of the uneven demands to survive forces of exploitation and disposability. Titration is a form of modulation by degree that tempts a change in kind approaching thresholds that only cohere retroactively. So the livable unlivable binary is usurped by the generating of incremental degrees of being. Um, and so in, in response to Ezekiel's elaboration of preemptive power, um, I grapple with the question here about the difference and relationship, uh, difference of and relationship to um, uh, or between preemptive and prehensive power. Um, it's not so easy to parse out the two. So, you know, I'm thinking through the work of Whitehead and Luciana Parisi and Patricia Clough, 
um, to you know, ask a question about, about these relations. If the preemptive is a mode of grasping, using information and calculation to create, delimit, or derail a certain event, to shut down the indeterminate affect or proclivity, a certain kind of future, the prehensive is a mode of intervention, modulation, and titration into what is understood to be lively beyond preemption. There's a slippage between the two, but one thing I'm thinking is that preemption is not only a technology, but a narrative strategy. So for example, Gaza will be uninhabitable by 2020 that assists the power of the prehensive to mess with vitality with excess. So in this sense, um, I would argue that maiming is a strategy that is about encountering the impossibility of stripping the body of resistance. Again, these are all, these are all questions. There's another form of uh, individual making that is not reliant or solely sustained by data-driven technologies. Israeli soldiers' descriptions of sniper targeting suggest that there's an additional process akin to the data individual process of sensing, sifting, and sorting. Understanding the fleshly rendering of individuals entails shifting from the disabled body signified as such um, to non-representational becomings of debility and capacity that reorient our attention away from prosthetics, from lack, and from amputation as absence, and also away from gender, from martyrdom, and secular renderings of biological life. Dividualizing does not so much, um, does not break down or dismember the body, knees, ankles, limbs, rather never recognizes these disparate elements as part of a composite in the first place. The target becomes not a, a body, not the Palestinian or Palestinian body, not even the Palestinian limb, but simply the or a limb. Um, this is a little bit of a digression, but there is a constitution here about, uh, there's a question here about the constitution of limbs as quote unquote new targets and the ballistics and non-lethal weaponry designed um, towards fostering that constitution. And so there's a lot more to say about the growth of the non-lethal weapons industry, the development of um, crowd control weapons, the increasing use of these weapons to justify injuring as a form of not killing, thereby authorizing greater use of weapons and increasing rather than decreasing violence on the part of police and military. And we can see these tactics increasingly um, in Chile, in Kashmir, in Lebanon, in France, in the United States, for sure, where after um, epic scenes of police brutality, including the murder of George Floyd, the assault on peaceful protesters included the targeting and blinding of a number of journalists with rubber bullets. Um, and now we have the more humane alternative of just shoot them in the leg, President-elect Joe Biden. So the humanitarian logic of non-lethality, you will not be killed and never mind about being injured, and the rapid growth, um, rapid global expansion of the non-lethal ammunitions industry um, has been argued, it has been argued by Paul Rocher um, that this, these, th these factors are indicative of an increasing use of disablement and maiming to contain political uprisings. There is the intimacy of proximity here. Snipers and protesters are not far from each other. Their faces, sometimes their eyes meet. One learns not to see the limb, one, one learns not to see the limb as missing a or missing the body. This intimacy is what allows, rather than thwarts, seeing a human arm or leg as a part that floats free of the human form, available to the sniper as perceptually decoupled from the body. The intimacy that is produced with the part has as its corollary the situatedness of the rest of the individual's body. And so this relational frame of sight dividuates, in fact, by unseeing the body as a co composite and situating these parts in a more than human biopolitics in relation to other organic and non-organic entities, be they infrastructural, ecological, biophysical, interspecies, um, as well as in relation to this process of titrating life. As reported extensively by Haaretz on March 6, 2020, by Israeli journalist Hilo Glazer, soldiers tally the knees um, and other limbs they have conquered at the end of each day. Glazer describes the chain of command through the words of this IDF commander, 
quote, for every sniper, there was a commander at a junior level like me, and also a senior commander, a company commander, or a deputy company commander. The superior officer would request authorization to fire from the sector's brigade commander. He would get on the radio to him and ask, can I add another knee for this afternoon? In this visual to data economy and vice versa, um, initiated by the sniper's viewpoint and circuited through the bureaucracy of authorization and tabulation, the individual is a ground zero analysis of fragments that are not of a whole, of bodily metrics and of sub-individual capacities. The composite of the body is irrelevant. It is unimportant that it exists. While the maimed individual is fantasized as um, uh, available for empowerment and prosthetic technologies, the individual is a communicated expectation and relies on soliciting training the plasticity of parts. So, you know, for example, the, the obvious uh, prosthetic of the wheelchair gives way to the slingshot, um, but more importantly, the expansion of what a prosthetic is to all forms of capacitation um, this is a you know kind of intervention of critical disability studies here. So what counts as a prosthetic, um, you know, in terms of a de and re-territorialization of infrastructures, architectures, and objects, is a completely open um, question. And in this case, it's a question uh, whereby injury is situated in a biosphere of war ecology that includes decimated health infrastructure structures, absence of medications, proliferation of super viruses, and wounds that are resistant to healing. Sniping therefore acts as source material for renewing settler colonial subjectivity and entitlement that has temporarily exhausted the utility of aerial bombing, drones, and other forms of remote control violence. The blockade of Gaza oscillates between intimate and remote, remote forms of control, suggesting settler ambivalence about both proximity to and difference from the colonized. Maiming is therefore the reiterative performative of the uh, potentially of the founding event of settler colonialism that contributes to its enduring structure. Maiming rehearses the violent separation of bodies from land. In the case of Palestine, we could surmise that the right to maim is in fact the precondition for settler colonial occupation. Patrick Wolf has importantly argued that settler colonialism is a structure and not an event, stressing that elimination of the native is not accomplished only via a one-off genocide. So the endless repetition of the founding moment renders porous the limits of the event in time such that event and structure are no longer opposed and neither do they disappear um, each other. The events of maiming compose the debilitating structure of settler colonialism, which is a recursive structure. Um, and just as an aside, I think we can think of the invocation of herd immunity as one such example of this kind of affective renewal of settler subjectivity and process. So where is the potential in these individual economies? We do not yet know what kinds of genders emerge from the foreclosed adulthoods that childhood stunting apparently delimits. Um, I'm thinking here of the constellation um, generated by the work of Hortense Spillers and C. Riley Snorton on engendering fungibility and fugitivity. We do not yet know what kinds of rearrangements of domestic and political spheres can be generated from these scenes of mass debilitation. We can hail Spinoza again, what can a body do through the bio and necropolitical? How do populations live the unlivable? As a becoming pandemic in introduces novel precarities while reinforcing old ones, we will be asking these questions again and again. I'm struck by the emptying out of the ethical that De Silva points to when she states, quote, I am interested in the ethical indifference with which racial violence is met, end quote. If, per her work and others, mass debilitation is the precondition for the existence of this thing called humanity, the ethical is still within the frame of the human and cannot address the individual uses of data and information, and um, thereby the force and necessity of a non-representational critique becomes all the more apparent. Um, and so that's 
that's where my comments stop. But what I wanted to, I just wanted to flag a couple of other things um, in Ezekiel's paper um, that I that I didn't mention. Um, the first one is just uh, this question of the preemptive and um, the the genealogy of that thought as well as that practice. Um, because there's been so much work, you know, the measuring of affect and the patrolling of affect has been long, long uh, has been a part of predictive policing. Um, and there was a lot of work um, after 9-11, both looking at um, the way preemptive power was working and also connecting it to the way preemptive power had already been working. So I'm just asking uh, a request or, or wondering about a kind of different or different multiple genealogies of um, onto power and uh, preemptive uh, power that actually um, center, especially the, the uh, work of um, feminists of color and black feminists. Um, the second uh, thing that I wanted to raise, and I, and I wanted to just reread um, Ezekiel's words, uh, which was really about this um, discrimination of uh, embedded in design that I think um, when when that discrimination is pointed out uh, often um, winds up becoming a stand-in for a non-representational critique when in actuality it's asking for a kind of redress of the of the discrimination so Ezekiel um, Ezekiel writes and I just want to hear more about this if systems of democratic practice have been built on hierarchizing logics of human difference and variation, then the identity and difference necessitated by algorithms will carry on those logics under the guise of objectivity. In fact, others have argued that the default of techno-social systems are discriminatory in their design. While I'm sympathetic to this argument, my intervention is not based on a critique of exclusion, but rather on an inherited onto epistemology of the algorithm, an ontological process of becoming and, and epistemological processing of information. Um, here, algorithmic governance entails a potentiation of value from and through machines in order to grant a recursive reconfiguration of being. Um, this recursion of reconfigured being is one based on a transparency principle that is the formation of the post enlightenment subject, which assumes hierarchies of difference, um, continues to haunt, these hierarchies continue to haunt the machine. Thus, rather than ask the question, who is included in the design of the technology or how is difference coded into the machine? I'm interested in the techno-social systems onto epistemology that is shaped by the colonialist reason of the post enlightenment subject. Um, so I just wanted to, to flag that as well as I think one of the main interventions um, that Ezekiel is, is making in his uh, paper, and I will stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Jasper. I'm sure Ezekiel would like to, to answer that, uh, you know, and that will probably conclude the first part of this uh, dialogue, and then we'll open onto the question, which are already been coming, by the way. So on to you, Ezekiel. All right. Th thank you, Tatiana. And uh, uh, thank you, Jasbir, for your really invigorating and, and, and energetic and just thoughtful um, paper, comments, even questions. Um, I'm, ch I'm, I'm trying to think of order whether I should begin with responding to, address, responding to some of your questions or even thinking about posing some. You know what I might do? Let me actually post some of my questions for you, and then we can almost delve into the, the questions together in, in dialogue. So um, I appreciate uh, the focus you give to the individual in your paper. I think this is a concept that has been touched on or used at various points throughout the symposium, um, yet not developed in the way you discussed it here. And related to that, I also appreciate your attention to time, algorithmic governance, and the affective force of uncertainty. Um, early on, uh, uh, you make the, the point, um, and, I, and I quote, the indeterminate is thus an ontological recoding of uncertainty that escapes the algorithmic governance of the bio-necropolitical state. The moment when preemptive power is meant to shape outcomes is exceeded by the emergent potentialities of those outcomes, close quote. 
I'd like to hear. I, I'd like to hear more, or even hear you expound further on how you see the indeterminate recoding of uncertainty escaping algorithmic governance. So I'm, I'm focusing on this, the, the language of escaping, and I, and I just w- would like to hear more about um, uh, how you're seeing seeing that that process unfolding and taking place. And 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 again, you know, so I'll just to f- focus on maybe the question here is what is meant by escape um, in in thinking with McKittrick, I do want to think um, about and through sort of the implications of um, the notion of the art of quantification. Um, this is especially compelling when uh, when you consider the calculation of the number of knees successfully shot by the IDF in Gaza or the quote epidemic uh, uh, epidemic of blindness in Kashmir. Um, while McKittrick's mathematics would tally these acts of state violence, she would also point toward uh, what they're not saying about the contours of Palestinian or Kashmir life. In other words, a kind of different reading of of those of, of the numbers. Um, and in fact, McKittrick even, just to quote McKittrick, the numbers set the stage for our stories of survival. Um, what is not there is living. Uh, the numbers, the ar- arithmetics of the skin. The shadow of the whip inspire our insurgency as they demonstrate the ways in which our present genre of the human is flawed. Indeed, numbers like the archives are truthful lies that can push us toward demonic grounds, a place not where one must choose between white supremacy and oppression, but rather honors the ways in which uh, blackness is archived as a violent beginning and to be sure does not consider this beginning as inevitably tied to trajectory that leads to something rightful or natural or ethical. Thus, I'd be interested to hear hear, um, hear you speak to a, a bit more the the stories of of, of survival or, or even just the alternative readings of those of those numbers um, that may be indicative in these calculative logics of violence and mass debilitation. I also really appreciate the argument you make with Joseph Pogliese, 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 I'm not sure if I'm saying his last name correctly, but where you state, uh, open quote, if we are to understand something, anything about what Joseph Pogliese calls a more than human biopolitics, it is that the individual and not the individual, it is the inhuman and not the human, that is the instrumentalized unit of such a biopolitics. This is so deeply important to algorithmic governance and I'd appreciate it. Uh, appreciate if we if we if we could just spend some time on this really provocative point, um, and uh, you also make a really important point about the focus of the individual when you state, open quote, individualizing does not break down or dismember the body, knees, ankles, limbs, rather never recognizes these disparate elements as part of a composite in the first place. Uh, the target becomes not the Palestinian, not even the Palestinian limb but simply the slash a limb, close quote. This is a profoundly important point that I don't think we can gloss over. Um, I think it, it gets at the, um, what I would characterize as the what's at stake in the focus on the individual. This is one I'd like to discuss further with you as I think the move to the individual in discourse is often situated at, or, or deployed without any stakes or making explicit what the stakes are um, your examples makes uh, your example uh, makes the, the the violence explicit and, and speaks more to the work it it, it does. Um, let me also just sort of almost begin to open a conversation by by even um, responding to at least a few or one or two of the questions that you pose, and then we, I'll try to thread through some of the rest as we as we go on. Um, um, and, and obviously in no particular order. So um, I, you, you, I'm not so sure if this was a question or just a point, but you mentioned in, in relation to racializing affect, um, how uh, you, make the, you made the point about how this happens through the rupturing of the reciprocity between um, to affect and to be affected. And, and in many ways, I think, um, um, I, 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 think I, I, I would almost even say sort of my, my turn to to Michelle St- Michelle um, Stevens on this is is very much so in that spirit. Literally, the the material remainder of um, um, the um, uh, interpolation of the skin that becomes that becomes literally enfolded into the flesh 
um, I'm going to jump around here. Um, I will jump to the um, I, I, you're really important, and um, uh, I, I yeah. I mean, I can't even underscore enough how important the the, the question and point is about uh, about the other genealogies of preemptive power and onto power. I think um, um, I mean. It, in, in some ways, there's a way in which it, 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 my own piece could sound like I'm almost privileging and put it placing it in in Masumi's um, table. But in fact, um, I think you're absolutely right that there are other genealogies, including, um, I mean, predictive policing has a long, long history. It goes back a century, in fact, um, and has different um, different um, uh, formations of of even of even development, even some of which come from the very my, as I character myself as a recovering psychometrician, <laughs> my the early days of my own discipline in psychometrics um, that had a lot to do with that, but then has has shaped into the use of supervised machine learning, particularly random forest, in in that. But then also, um, in particular, the um, uh, number of 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 um, feminists of color, including yourself, um, and. Um, uh, uh, of course, I'm blanking on other uh, others who, who are just not coming to mind right now, but um, who have also made um, uh, interventions and, and, and articulations about preemptive power, about um, um, a, a, a politics of, of even affect and even emotion um, that was um, was articulated actually going back at least um, to the 1980s, at least that I know of. Um, and so, I mean, I... I um, I mean, there's obviously much more that could be said there, and I and I look forward to hearing your um, your engagement on this as well, or your response to this. Um, and then the other thing I'll just mention um, is in the the point about um, discrimination by design. I, I um, so I, I what I'll say is I think the the focus on design um, has a way of of producing this veneer a veneer of of. Um, not being about representation, um, and, and when in fact there's um, there's a way in which it's so deeply um, cloaked, representation so deeply cloaked in it by the ways in which its focus is on um, a, a critique really of exclusion, a critique of categorical ex um, uh, exclusion, um, and in fact what that then does is it has this, has this uh, it, it then slips so easily into discourses of of retooling. Um, redesigning, um, uh, repurposing, and 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 I would argue that the these discourses, um, which in some ways, I mean, we we can one might argue we inherit so easily from post-structuralism, right? Reappropriation, right? Reuse. I mean, a Desertoian move um, uh, fundamentally actually misses the mark of how inherent in the axiomatics of the system is the recursive regeneration of Promethean man. Right, the transparent subject, uh, the self-determining subject that is that is in fact so enfolded and deeply Im embedded into the very axiomatics of the system itself. So, while there might be this move of trying to redesign and repurpose, it actually is not fundamentally getting at the very epistemology of the system. It's not transforming the fundamental epistemology of the system. Um, okay, I'm a. I, I, there are others here that I, I I'm gonna try to thread into. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'm open. I'll, I'll, I'll hold off and open it up for you on, on that. Um, nice. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Ezekiel. Um, my notes are all over the place, so I'm not sure what I'm going to address or not. I, I, just to say about Masumi, it's um, more a concern about, it's a concern about citational praxis, really. Um, mm -hmm. Not yours, but his. Um, so mm -hmm. anyway, I just wanted to to flag that because it's it being onto power is being produced as some kind of new concept or conversation and preemption as well. Um, you know, when it's so embedded in in the question of, of predictive um, policing and, and technologies, um, the you know what you um, you know, bring up in terms of like what the numbers don't tell us or the stories that are untold um, Catherine McKittrick's you know, understanding of the lives that um, are lived despite these numbers or outside of these numbers or outside of the data. Um, and that's kind of what I was trying to uh, gesture towards um, in the end, you know, in the end, in terms of talking about, for example, the uh, the scenes of maiming in Gaza are 
um, about, um, you know, they, they produce these representational scenes of masculinity, of maimed masculinity. Um, and so, and, and also um, kind of uh, instigate all of these concerns about the quote unquote burden of disability, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think there's so much more to be said about, you know, this is what I meant. We don't know, um, you know, stunt, stunting. Stunting is a, nor it's, it's a normative um, metric, health metric, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's imposed, uh, you know, in some kind of universal register. And yet we see the universal, a, a universal register of what counts as livability is absent, right? And so, what does it mean to decide a body is stunted or not thriving um, and that therefore foreclosed from a certain kind of adulthood or a certain kind of maturity? These are all normative metrics. And so in a way, um, you know, what the uh, preemptive as well as prehensive technologies, um, you know, will never capture or will never be able to account for are the ways in which the normative metrics are are not true, are, are not actual, are not what people are living, right? This is my question around um, if 2020 is here and Gaza is unlivable, what what do, how do we think about um, living the unlivable, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are so these are all you know um, kind of issues, is, you know issues and thoughts and and um, uh, you know possibilities. Um, yet to be known, I think, in some sense, right? Um, and also, in some ways, uh, you know, never to be known, I guess. Mm -hmm. it, in the situation of Palestine in particular, because of the it, extreme surveillance of the occupation and because of the politics around resisting um, occupying forces and technologies, a lot of the tactics of that are not necessarily um, available for um, people outside of communities to, to know of, right? So those stories, it's interesting to me, McKittrick, there's a temporality too. There's a, there's a kind of, um, what is the temporality of McKittrick's yeah. offering, right? Yeah. Which is maybe never to be known or not right. to be known um, or to be known intergenerationally, but not um, in a kind of um, specific political um, relational temporality, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate that, and 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 I'm always thinking about it. Um, uh, you know, um, in particular in terms of how this these questions about masculinity and femininity get get um, codified for mass media um, for the rest of us as well, and in the and in these numbers. Mm. I, I guess the one other, two other things. One is, I mean, you asked this question about what's at stake in the focus in the individual. I mean, I would love to know beyond, like I would love anyone to a kind of, ex, you know, for me beyond, um, you know, and this goes to the kind of, injury as future violence, right? Um, so Paul Rocher's work is basically documenting um, the increase of injury um, as a kind of um, uh, correlate to the decrease of death, right? And, uh, and kind of the justification of the increase of injury um, as a humanitarian intervention through these technologies. And his argument is kind of the more illiberal um, a liberal democracy becomes, the more violence through injury will occur in order to contain political resistance and political uprising. So um, I guess, you know, what's at stake in the focus of the individual is really t trying to get to grips with the kind of fleshly aspect of the individual, which is about these, you know, understanding um, bodies uh, or body parts, but not, not as parts, um, but like entities and, and targeted entities. And what, you know, I, I, there, there's the scene of, of, um, of uh, mass maiming that, you know, uh, emerges out of the great march that we're all familiar with. Um, and what that has done is normalize um, the kind of sovereign right to maim for a global audience that is like, okay, we're being tutored and trained into that way of understanding um, what a massacre is on other terms, right? Mm -hmm. What a genocide is through what Fred Moten calls a kind of uh, genocide as perpetual injuring, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, so there's that. So there's that what's at stake, um, you know, and the other, I guess another part of what's at stake is really, um, you know, when you think of training soldiers to do this kind of work or you, or you think of, um, you know, what goes into tabulating these, right? Um, it's not, it's, it's linked to earlier forms of tabulation, but I think it's, a, it's something a little bit different. And so we can make those linkages to uh, through Simone Brown's work or, or Cara, Cara Keeling's work, we can make Jennifer Morgan's work, we can make those linkages to technologies of tabulation, but there is something I think at stake in this, um, in this understanding of individual um, economies and seeing and conceptualizing individually, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason why this, I think this matters is because, and again, you know, no one, um, you know, you know, if, 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 if your knee has been targeted, no one is, no, no one whose knee is targeted is going to be like, oh, it's just my knee. It's the part, mm -hmm. it's the part, it's a individual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's not the lived, obviously that's not the lived experience. So the question is really, how are we being solicited and trained into these economies of thinking, um, uh, you know, and understanding violence um, as, uh, um, as a, you know, individual violence as a kind of accompaniment to um, the violence that we understand the body to go through otherwise. May, may I add one one more to this, to, to what uh, everything you just laid out is, um, in, in addition to the violence that, uh, that in fact, the, the individual economy does to, we might say, the individual, um, uh, there's also, not in all cases of the individual economy, I think, um, but in various cases, we can come up with a number of different examples where there's a circumventing of subjective of subjectification, right? right? Um, and, and in fact, just to give an example of this, um, when someone is going up uh, in front of court um, and being and being sentenced, and there's a, a predictive policing algorithm that's being used as a risk assessment um, to actually that's actually providing some risk score to the judge in order to figure out to, for them to decide and, and on what what the um, sentence will be. Um, that that uh, the defendant doesn't even know that's going on. Mm -hmm. That they, they don't even know that in fact they're, they're, this risk score is being given to to the to the judge let alone what data is being used right and so there's 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 a there's a de a degree of of circumventing that the of subjectivation that that we're we're um that goes on in the individual economy that i think is is um a, a turn if you will, a distinct um um uh what's the word um a distinction between the focus on the individual and and, dis and, and disciplinary um, uh, uh, regimes, if you will. Yeah, I think I, this is this is part of what I was I was trying to get at that the individual is not um, uh, a kind of um, you know uh, like a dot, like a um, stripping down of the individual, um, but actually has a different purpose to it as well. And I I think we can see. You know, you're talking about circumventing of subject subjectification or subjectivization, um, and these risk wars. What data is being used? And I, I think it's you know obviously part of what's going on with COVID right now, right? Um, so we have these numbers, and we assume that these numbers of human deaths matter in a particular um, humanistic frame. Um, but if we, and this is De Silva's work again, if and and also Gina Brown is kind of pointing to this. If we move out of that humanistic frame. How are things being counted, mm. um, and how are things being um, understood as as losses or gains, uh, casualties, not casual, that kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, the numbers are the, the numbers as as currently stated um, solicit shock from from liberal viewers, and then then also, um, and of course, numbers you know, stories, people, deaths, all of that stuff, right? When the violence of this system is actually also taking place on another level, that's not really as clear to us, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering about that, that kind of interface too, between the question of humanity and then the question of 
pure capacitation and metrics, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the relationship between the two. One last thing I wanted to mention that I keep forgetting is that you said something about sovereign discipline and control technologies of capture continuing to exist in concert. It is increasingly control that becomes a dominant logic of systems of mm -hmm. governance. And I have kind of um, relentlessly continued to theorize sovereign power, um, disciplinary power and control power in relation, enmeshed, endlessly enmeshed in each other. So I just want to, you know, for me, that that kind of um, recourse to control as the dominant logic of systems of government is a kind of Deleuzian trap, only because then we focus on data and technology in this way. When, of, of course, you know, the, the titration economy going on in Gaza, of course, informs the way individual flesh is then, you know, um, organized as a, as a relationality. So they're not separated out from each other, but I'm not sure one, I, I wouldn't want to, they're, they're always enmeshed, I think, in some, in, some, um, in some important ways, right? And not derivative ways. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I mean, in, in fact, I like the, 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 the language that you use and right to maim of oscillation, that, the, that they're, they're constantly in oscillation with one another. Um, and, and in fact, I also would say that there's a way in which, um, you know, under the pandemic, we can begin to see how that, that actually is, is, it's not as simple as that, that in fact, certain forms of discipline and disciplinary societies, even sovereign has, have even, have even returned in, 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 in ways that are, that um, we uh, would not have necessarily have, have, have um, uh, expected in, in, in a particular per understanding what kind of projection are moving forward um, toward toward what um, did you sort of uh, prophetically predicted or of 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 control societies okay I see Tiziana trying to get in here <laughs> well we you know it's wonderful you know I could just listen to you forever and I think it's uh, you know you brought so much to this symposium and it's really great that we are closing in you uh, I think yours has been a critical and crucial uh, diffraction of, uh, you know, established and important themes such as algorithmic governance, you know, the way you connected uh, number to flesh, uh, I think that the kind of correction of the delusion trap of this kind of disembodied notion of individual that just been mentioned is very, very important as well, again, as you're reading of uh, the racialization of algorithmic governance, are very, very, very important. We have a number of questions. So we would like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read some of the questions that have been selected by the uh, media team and Oana Parvan in particular, my wonderful co-chair who's been uh, so active behind the scenes uh, throughout this uh, very uh, intense two weeks. So I have the first question is uh, from um, Anonymous to Ezekiel. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm wondering, and this is an open question, about what kind of diffraction can the algorithm do in its own computational processing, as opposed to the diffraction in quantum physics. Are these diffractions working together? If so, where do you see the sociogenic working in relation between, in the relation between algorithm and data? And yeah, uh, maybe, you know, we can, we can start with that question and then I have another question for just here. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you for this question. Um, so. It, it, I mean, hands down, what I'm talking about right now, at least. I mean, we while there is quantum computing that is being developed, and uh, I know at Duke and even at um, at IBM, I mean, that's not um, uh, a widely accessible and even usable thing as, at this point. So, what I'm talking about really is it really is not the the form of um, diffraction from quantum physics. In some ways, I'm sort of using it, I, I, to be quite honest, I'm using it somewhat kind of analogistically to think through how, the ways in which the um, the patterns and rhythms of, of, of the generation of data are then, then become um, diffracted and then through the very um, a mechanism of algorithms, thinking about algorithms as diffractive apparatuses in and of themselves. Um, and as such, um, the sociogenic, in fact, is working in and through um, the, the um, rhythms and patterns of, of diffract, of, 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 of the world, if you, of the data that then becomes diffracted in and through the algorithms. Um, 
I mean, I think it, implicit in this in this question is also the t the, the move that I'm trying to to also make um, with regard to the potentiality of of diffraction, um, and and I and it's one of the reasons why I do turn to um, uh, uh, on the one hand the notion of allopoiesis, and even um, I make reference to Luciana Parisi's um, uh, xenopatterning patterning and even alien intelligence, and even um, uh, the um, the the um, very tension between um, recursive systems as being finite systems and the inf and the infinite information in the world. So what Luciana will talk about as the incomputable, right? The very potentiality of the incomputable. So I I'm I, I make reference to this as well as even Denise Ferrada da Silva's Black um, Feminist Poetics because in, I I think fundamentally those are necessary in order to even um, uh, uh, move toward any kind of transformative model, a model that is anything, anything toward a kind of speculative computation, or even, um, or even as as we've talked about, as a cosmic computation in the manifesto. Thank you, thank you, Tegan. I have another question from an, another anonymous attendee for Jasbir. Jasbir, thank you for your talk, Jasbir. In what ways do you think that the structure of settler colonialism enacted against Palestinians is a laboratory for contemporary techno-capitalism? I mean, I, I um, ab absolutely yes, and um, and 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 not the only laboratory, right? These are all kind of connected themes of laboratory. I think um, there's you know there's been a lot of work on. Um, you know, the kinds of technologies per, like perfected, Israeli technologies perfected um, through uh, the violent, violence against Palestinians um, and upon Palestinians uh, in terms of the weapons industry. And so, you know, Israel was one of the first countries to start using rubber bullets in the 70s. Um, so again, this, this kind of um, more interconnected analysis of non-lethal, um, ammunitions and weapons industry and, and to kind of de-exceptionalize um, in some ways the nation state or even one particular site as a laboratory and understand that all of these um, technologies are being used uh, through, like a, there's, a, there's an in, interfacing interests in these technologies, right? Um, and so what is a lab for, um, uh, these, these labs are interconnected. So there's certainly um, similar things going on in Kashmir as well. But we see that these technologies are also distributed um, in various places as well. Like we're, we, there's the lab, the lab is coming for all of us. <laughs> the lab is, is, you know, it's being generated everywhere. And so um, there's, and I, I don't say that to minimize the very specific use of Gaza as a kind of um, uh, testing ground for a lot of things, but just to say that there's a connected economy um, in terms of what do we do with this, what hap what does capitalism do with disposable populations or populations that would otherwise be disposed of or disposable? How does um, how does uh, capitalism uh, you know, uh, make value out of those populations, right? Like that might be just the animating question of the lab itself. How do we, um, you know, produce, how do we uh, produce primitive, primitive accumulation and surplus value from these populations? Thank you, just Pierre, for your answer. I have another question from Luciana Parisi to Tzikil. Uh, can you tell us more about how the mathematics of black life and black allopoiesis can come together in computational patterning? Great question. <laughs> um, I, I almost want to, I almost wish I could just say, what do you think? <laughs> but, but no. Um, so into, on the one hand, I would say mathematics of black life, I think has a way of, of um, or at least I would say McCutcheck is actually almost pushing us to, focus on almost an alternative reading of the data, a reading almost be, uh, as I, I might even characterize beyond beyond um, beyond man, beyond even whiteness, if you will, right? Um, and while, while at the same time, I think about black allopoiesis is, is um, almost pointing toward an open radical praxis of, of recursion, an open system that is fun, that, that's 
that is um what's the word um uh that, that's open to even the multiplicity of potentialities are actually producing something different, a, a transformation in the epistemology of its of its system. And in some ways, I think there's a there's a way in which we 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 can think of think one through the other, like how mathematics of black life, how an alternative reading of the data actually can be produce in and through a system that becomes open to alternative onto epistemologies. Um, and so uh, so there's a way in which it, we, we, we fundamentally have to, in order to move toward this, we have to see in, in, in an image, if you will, um, of a cursive system that can that that is not fixed in its parameters, that is not um, uh, seeking to com uh, only rege regenerate its, its itself same, but actually seeking to move towards something different, an alternative an, an alternative epistemology, an alternative onto epistemology that that um, fundamentally can get us towards some uh, a, an alternative kind of um, futurity, if you will. Um, yeah, I think I think that's the answer I got for you right now. <laughs> oh, you're, you're muted. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is a good answer you know, from what I could hear. So the next question is from uh, uh, another one of the, the participants to the symposium, Martina Tazzioli, uh, who was uh, speaking to us the other day from the Politics Within Border panel. And the question is from just uh, is to just beer. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the great talk. If individual data is nowadays at the core of processes of valuation and capitalization and laboring affects do not concern the body itself, but the circulation of multiple data, in which direction should we reframe anti-exploitation politics and claims? In other words, when it is not only a question of a hold of a discrete subject and bodies, and how do the biopolitical debilitating strategies and the right to maim that target, as you explain in your work, populations are related to the capitalization and extraction of individual data? That is, I'm very interested in understanding more how your analytics of debilitation that you developed in your work can be reformulated in relation to individuals. That is, who is that debilitated in that case? There's a lot there, and I'm not sure I've tracked. I'm not sure I've tracked on everything. Um, I think one of the things that I was trying to do in this paper was really to connect, um, you know, individual as data to individual as a kind of fleshly, fleshly reorganizing of the flesh as well, um, or a kind of fleshly, or wh where what happens to corporeality, and I don't even mean human form or human corporeality, but what happens to the question of corporeality um, and relations of flesh in terms of um, individual economies. So insofar as um, maiming, I, I think I laid out in maiming that, that, the, that these practices of sniper targeting, for example, are as much informed by um, the question of uh, the dehumanization of the Palestinian as they are informed by um, the bodily, you know, bodily training and kind of uh, sensing the knee, sensing the eye, sensing um, these different ways of interpreting like a, a threat, right? Um, as Ezekiel was talking about in terms of what is the threat? So the threat is a knee, the threat is an eye. Like what are these, what are the, how are these body parts constituted as threats? So in a way, these are, um, they, they're interlinked economies. It's just that the question of um, what needs to be preempted, um, you know, and what the actual threat is. I think those those objects are are slightly changed in um, in the individual economies, right? Um, again, just to refer to COVID, like the numbers of deaths is subtended also by these other individual economies of maiming um, that are paying attention to other targets of threat. I think. So this is, but this is also to be continued. Um, and unfolded. Just to say that I, I think you were asking about a kind of contradiction, and I don't, I don't think there is one actually. Thank you, thank you for that for that answer. Uh, I have another question from Mitch to Ezekiel. I'm really interested in your discussion of the flesh and how this enters the algorithms of interpolation and prehension. Could we think of the flesh here 
a centering, even in mathematics, something akin to the computational mathematics of convertibility. Is this part of what you're implying when you mention compression? Yes. Yeah, so in fact, when, so in, in part, I'm, I'm, when, I, when I'm thinking Flesch, I'm, also, I'm, I'm thinking uh, Spillers, um, I'm thinking De Silva, um, and, but also, um, as I mentioned, um, Michelle Stevens. Um, and, I'm, and part of the reason why, you know, so part of my move to go to, to talk about, um, to, my move toward rhythms and patterns is also to think about the rhythms and patterns that actually become the material remainder in the flesh, right? And so, yes, um, uh, uh, the very notion, the, the very idea of um, uh, that which is becoming incompressible or that which is even sought to be compressed in, in um, computational, um, uh, computational systems, I am, yes, thinking about the, the flesh and the ways in which that, the very rhythms and patterns that become the material remainder of, of symbolic race on the skin actually do become part of the very recursive um, process of that which is um, training or subsequently, um, for lack of better words, feeding the very algorithms, the computational systems themselves. And, and I should say, hey, Mitch. <laughs> okay. I wanted to ask something about, I mean, I, 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 the word that keeps coming to me is um, the question of pace. I mm. don't know why, but when I think about slow life and I think about this dichotomy between speed and slowness um, and this question of rhythm and patterns, I realize that there's, you know, part of, um, the kind of um, affective uncertainty that's always going on is about a, the senses of rhythm and patterns, but also a sense of pace. And I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on how that factored into the recursivity of um, the kind of data systems that you're talking about. What is pace and computational terms? Yeah. yeah, I mean, so on the, on the one hand, we can easily think about the... Um, rapid speed of 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 algorithms and, and algorithmic um, uh, communication, if you will, especially um, especially between algorithms. Um, I mean, this is a you know, uh, um, Catherine Hales and, uh, talks uh, talks about this in, with regard to financialization algorithms and, and even the um, milliseconds, I, I believe, um, that that she talks about that, that literally the. I believe it's between 0.3 and 0.5 um, milliseconds of the speed in which the, these algorithms are moving and, and at, a, at a level of, of uh, if, if I remember correctly, she characterizes as non-conscious perception. Um, but, you know, I actually want to point to, especially in relation to pace and slowness, there's also what's known as human in the loop, right? Where you have... Um, in in a in in this in a recursive system, um, there's um, structured in is a human programmer whomever that is um, constantly modulating the recursive process of the system. So literally, the making sure the parameters are maintaining a certain um, uh, uh, some some degree of parameterization, making sure. Um, that the algorithm is not be misbehaving, if you will, um, or making or, or regularly. So you know, I, I'll use the example of predictive policing again. That it's not an automated recursive system, and it's, it's in fact um, a non-automated recursive system. By way of um, the algorithm is trained on some set of some set of data and then um it's deployed and used over some period of time it could be six months it could be a year and then it's retrained again mm -hmm. um but it's it's literally there's a way in which that where that human in the loop process actually enables a modulation of time a stretching of temporality in a way that um i think actually um more even more so speaks to the slow down life that I think you're 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 going after in in, in your work and and I'm thinking about this even in relation to so for example um, the the checkpoints I mean uh, I, I I think one of the questions that I had asked you back um, before back in back in October was how what is the 
what is the model or or method of of um, that's behind where the checkpoints are and and, and as I understand it they, they're they're it's random right so wherever those checkpoints are it's random temporally and spatially now correct me if I'm if I misunderstood that but um, uh, it, it, that would be a, quite a sophisticated way of going about it because you could never predict, right? So those so Palestinians would never be able to predict exactly where, where and when that checkpoint is going to arise. But what is systematic? I would argue, and this is part of what I was trying to allude to when I when I say the calculated um, mechanics. I forgot exactly the language I used, but um, is the way in which they do the checkpoints that maintains a certain type of rhythm. Uh, or pace, if you will. Um, so I, I, I think there's a, there are different ways in which time can be stretched or even rapidly compressed. And, and again, I'll raise the mm -hmm. last, last point. I mean, it's, it's literally, we're feeling it quite deeply in the pandemic right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have, uh, I think I would like to have the two last questions, one uh, which is compressed between a, a kind of compressed version between two different ones, so just beer, and then another final one for Ezekiel. So I'm going to start with just beer, and then we'll have the last question to Ezekiel, and then we'll move to the end. So the, we have two questions for you, just beer, and the first one asks you to uh, expand on the notion of racializing affect uh, uh, and whether uh, it's something that had to do more with time or uh, um, as an affecting modality or with this individualization of both. The second question is a bit longer. Uh, it's about uh, the experience of, of the anonymous uh, attendee who's asking the question of reading uh, uh, Black Lives Matter and the Palestinian resistance side by side mm -hmm. uh, as marked by similar forms of ethical indifference, racial violence, and thinking about your theorization of the march of return as the normalization of the sovereign right to name and the spectacle of it. So the question is how can we account for politics enacted from within this same unavoidability of being maimed? Can you give Ezekiel his question so I can think about this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll anticipate the question to Ezekiel. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it starts with a thanks uh, to both of you for your inspiring talks. Uh, and he, the question is about asking Ezekiel to expand on his conclusions. So whether he sees a possibility of escaping algorithmic governance of time and space, uh, how to develop a chance to envision other futures. Uh, is this connected somehow to what just be indexed as Black Utopias in, the relation, in a reference to this uh, um, you know, exciting new book? Is it somehow connected to the capacity of retooling and repurposing the design of platforms? So these are the, the, the two final questions. So I, you know, I'll leave it up to you. And then uh, we'll close recursive colonialism. 2020. Well, I mean, I think Ezekiel, you were talking about the limits of, res of, of retooling platforms, right? So if we're taking De Silva seriously, pretty much every concept that we are using has to be interrogated for this onto-epistemological continual recourse to the Prometheus man, right? Like as as you pointed out. So, um, you know, there's uh, like I think that's why I ended my talk with the you know the understanding in De Silva's terms that mass debilitation is the condition of humanity, right? It is the precondition of something we call humanity, um, and within those terms of humanity. The forms of redress around mass debilitation, you know, involve the recourses to the very systems that De Silva is saying um, are already embedded um, uh, with logics of, of the sustained um, condition of possibility of mass, mass debilitation. So um, disability rights, defunding the all of these things, right, uh, defunding the police, abolition, um, all of these really important things. Um, are also embedded in this question of um, the conditions of, of humanity, if I'm understanding De Silva's work. So I don't have the answers to any of that, um, but just noting that um, I, th I think for me, you know, I've, I have um, understood, you know, the problems with teleological, notions of teleological time and history, notions of, um, uh, the notion of modernity and alternative modernities or non-modernities, all of these things, 
Um, but I think that Denise's work is taking us to another place where um, she's like, and, and this is also, you know, even the slow time thing, which is, is it, is it time? Why do we call it time? What, what are we going to, are we still thinking about time? And I think that's what I'm trying to get to, that slow time is, is, and is no time at all in some ways. It, it has to be kind of um, taken out of the kind of conventional forms of redress that we have been conditioned to pursue as political subjects, right? That was a, I, I, that was a great response. And in some ways I was gonna, I feel like I wanna build on it some, uh, and by, by even, um, even just speaking to, just saying that, you know, that time in and of its time itself, as you, as you talk about it, is, is as an affective um, uh, modulation, if you will, um, affective um, uh, uh, experience literally of that which we even think is, is time, but in fact, it really, it merely is even a, a kind of prehension of that, of, of, um, uh, of a, of a, I might even characterize as a no longer and a not yet, um, and even of a, of a, of a present. Um, so it, the other thing is, so I want to come respond directly to the, to the, uh, to the other questions, but specifically for me, I, I think um, if, if we can move beyond the pessimism of um, state interest, of uh, interest of capital. Um, uh, then I think there, then we can begin to to um, um, uh, image and, and even consider what might be a, a a different form of I don't even know if I want to call it algorithmic governance. Mm -hmm. I think it's something. I think it's something else. I think it's 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 a you know um, if I if I the words that are coming to mind for me right now is a. Um, uh, a poetical, a poetical kind of um, uh, form of, of algorithmic e existence is not the right word, but just futurity. But I, I you know, it, it, governance just has so much laid in it about uh, discipline, control, shaping. Um, you know, you know, rather rather than a, a kind of um, movement toward um, an affirmation, enabling an opening of, of a multiplicity of forms of existence and, and life. Um, I, I, that's my answer to that question. That's a very nice last word. I think that's a perfect uh, last word to finish on. So with this, uh, we are drawing to a close. So these uh, two very intense, as I said, two weeks. It's been a really great experience. Uh, I would like... Uh, to thank for today's uh, really engaging and uh, important conversation, uh, uh, just be poor at Sigil Dixon Roman. Uh, and uh, we close with this. Uh, there is a bit, was a bit of a setback. So I have to inform our audience that DJ set by Shannon SP that we were supposed to premiere after this talk will not be available for reasons independent from us. We're disappointed. So this is the final session of Recursive Colonialism, Artificial Intelligence and Speculative Computation 2020. All sessions are available on our YouTube channel and our manifesto and curatorial pieces are available on our website, www.recursivecolonialism.com. I wish to extend some special thanks to all our speakers and audience, to the media team and to the Critical Computation Bureau to my uh, co-conspirator, co Ezekiel, uh, Luciana, Brian, uh, and Oana, and Alessandra, and Olga, and all the others who participated in organizing this, this event. Thank you for you know, being together with us on this journey. Stay safe, everyone, and we hope to meet you again uh, soon. Bye-bye.